Something that I talked about with Mike Tomlin and the Pittsburgh Steelers is that I think they're gearing up their offense to be ahead of what's coming in the NFL as far as styles of offense that find successes against the current styles of defense. We'll talk more about that. Also, how Mike Tomlin responded to questions about Marcus Allen, Deontay Johnson, and their penalties from the Panthers game. And what do the Steelers need to do to contain Devontae Adams? Because they've been eaten up by a lot of big name receivers this year. All that and more right here in the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Today, joined by Josh Taylor of 93.7 The Fan and KDKA TV. It's going to be a fun one. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things of the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find the show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button in the video if you enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. Ultimate Football GM is where you can you can take some of your dreams to become an NFL GM to life and play this great mobile game. It's right, it can be downloaded right to your phone. Just visit ultimate-gm.com ultimate or look it up in the app stores. Our listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, Locked On, all caps, all one word, and you can use that to play Ultimate Football GM. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Joining, as I said, today is Josh Taylor. He is back on the show. Josh, how you doing, friend? I'm good, man. It's it's weird because we we saw the past couple weeks, just like the way these games have unfolded, it, you just kind of see things flip around, and it just it, it's almost like a really good TV show. You just never know how it's going to end. It just keeps us on our toes between Wednesday and Sunday. So, kind of, I'm kind of enjoying watching all of this just kind of play out in real time. It's been it's been interesting, but not in a great way. It's been interesting in like I don't know what's gonna happen way. Like there's an old Chris Rock joke about like how how bad relationships are exciting. It's starting <laughs> to border on that 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 particular zone. So I'm kind of just enjoying the the madness of watching it ensue. Not not with what's happening on the field. I'm talking about what's happening on the outside with people just reacting to what's happening on the field. That, that you, you are right about that. We'll get into how those reactions have been, but something I wanted to talk to you about is. I think the Steelers, and I said this after the game, I think the Steelers are trying to get ahead of where things are going for the path of the NFL. It's, it's the, the NFL has been a pendulum. You know, when teams get really good at stopping, get really good at running the football, team, defenses have geared up to stop the run, and then passing has been more, has flourished in the NFL. I think you saw that for about a decade plus with the Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, that whole era where passing got a little happy in the NFL. But I think more and more teams are starting to gear their way into running the football because a lot of defenses, you don't see as many of the big, tough linebackers that play that that, that, are, that are strictly there to stuff the run. You don't see as many nose tackles in the league who are there to stuff the run. You see I mean, a lot of smaller, quicker type of players who are there to get after the quarterback or cover in space in the middle part of the field. And that's something that I think that some teams are trying, like the Niners, who are right now, they're fighting with a third-string quarterback. They're playing really good football. Their line is beefed up. They went and got Christian McCaffrey, and they're looking like a team that could be one of those teams that, that, that fight their way and become a, a dark horse in the playoff race to get to the Super Bowl. I, I think the teams are starting to recognize that, like, hey, if you play this style of football, you can win. The Steelers don't have the guns to play that style of football just yet, but they need the foundation. And that's why I said after they went over the Panthers that I think this was another sign that the foundation is being set. They still need to go get some st some superstar offensive linemen, some top-tier guys that they'll add to this group. I think they still need some bigger guys up front for their own defense. But I do think that not, the, the one-two punch of Najee Harris and Jalen Warren is absolutely a part of that plan. And it's also the plan to help Kenny Pickett in the next next several years you know, not have to take too much on his shoulders, be a leader, but lead in a way that doesn't require him to make all the plays. Usually I'm good for one movie reference per show. You are. Can I can I get it out of the way early? Let's get it. And I won't even be saying anything. I'm just going to practice my Grinch who stole Christmas face real quick. 
You're, st this you're is, stupid. This is me smiling because what have I been talking <laughs> about for months now, Chris? Yes. Months. I have been talking about this for months. And we talked about this, I want to say, probably a year ago. We knew going into this offseason that this was going to be once, especially once we knew Kevin Colbert was retiring and they were going to have a new GM and some changes mm. in the front office. We knew that this would be the moment, the opportunity for Mike Tomlin to rebuild this franchise in his image, or at least this roster in his image and after his likeness. We talked about this a couple of different times. And part of that particular building was based on three basic tenets, running the football, playing defense, and winning the turnover battle. The teams that you're mentioning, especially teams like San Francisco, teams like Philly, teams like even Miami, if you want to count the Dolphins, you know what they're doing really well? They're running the football, they're playing defense, and they're not turning it over. Even teams like the Giants, even teams like Washington and Dallas, the whole NFC East division is doing it. Yep, Running the football, playing defense, and not turning it over. It is becoming a trend that's going throughout the league. Go look at the teams that are either leading the divisions outside of Tennessee or Tampa – and ones that are also in playoff positions without being in first place in certain divisions because the rest of them are terrible. But go look at those teams. They're running the football. They're playing defense and they're not turning it over. But I'm glad you brought up the other part too. This is a league that is shifting towards defending the pass. Chris, I can't tell you how many times over the last six or seven years, especially before 2017, where people were asking me, why is Ryan Shazier playing linebacker? He's more of a safety. The entire league is shifting in that direction. The entire league is shifting towards faster, more athletic linebackers. And honestly, the Steelers were ahead of the curve with Ryan Shazier trying to make that they transition were. happen. They were really trying to stay ahead of that curve. And unfortunately, five years hurt, ago, yeah. everything changed. And that was what I consider, we talked about it before, one of the major lines of demarcation in this franchise's recent history was that night in, in December in Cincinnati. And everything changed after that. Not to mention the fact they never found another guy that had that same element that Ryan Shazier has. They haven't found them yet. They're still looking for them, and I imagine that kind of replacement will be here soon. But to your, to your point, I'm glad you brought up a team like San Francisco because San Francisco is doing what they're doing with their third-string quarterback. And I, I saw this question on Twitter. Well, why can't we have the same kind of innovation San Francisco has? First of all, this team can't do the simple stuff like running a simple running back screen. Now you're going to fake a double screen? Let, let's let's get let's graduate first grade before you get the fourth grade. Let's not kid ourselves here. The second thing is you want to be like San Francisco, but you don't want to do the thing San Francisco's done. You know what San Francisco's done? They've drafted incredibly well, and they've got impact guys in pretty much every position group. Guys like Trent Williams on the offensive line. They traded for Christian McCaffrey. They drafted Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk. They, they brought in Mike George. McGlinchey. They brought in Mike. Well, I, I want to say they drafted McGlinchey too. They drafted Bosa. They drafted. They drafted both Dre Greenlaw and Fred Warner. And Dre mm -hmm. Greenlaw was a converted high school cornerback. And I know this because I covered him at Fayetteville High School ten years ago. That's what they did in San Francisco. Then they they drafted a guy like Hufenga, who was a game changer at safety. Mm -hmm. They brought in all these guys, homegrown, and drafted them and developed a team like this where this offense and defense can be one of the most physical, if not the most physical team in the league. They punch you in the mouth whether they have the ball or if they don't have the ball. If they have the ball, they'll punch you in the mouth with it and score past you. And if you don't have, if they don't have the ball, they'll punch you in the mouth and take it off of you and then score while they're punching you in the mouth. That's how San Francisco plays. But the league is starting to move back to that. I'll make another case. It may not be the best one given recent events, but New England's another good case. New England is a team that's been trying to transition into running the football and playing defense and being more physical. Philly, even though you look at Jalen Hurts and say, well, he's a mobile quarterback, Philly's another team that is very physical. That they, yep. Yes, I, I know their, their quarterback does a lot of different things, but their offensive lines and their defensive lines will hit you in they the set mouth. The tone. They and are physical. Who, and who from the, from the Eagles' front office did the Steelers add to their front office this past offseason? I know, I know, Andy Weidel. There you go. I, Chris, I've been telling people for weeks, they're like, I don't understand what the Steelers are doing. Go look at Philly. Before that Philly game happened, I told a couple friends of mine, I said, watch what Philly does and then take notes because that's what you're going to see this team do in a couple years because Andy Weidel is going to try to rebuild this team and rebuild this roster. He's going to start in the trenches. He's going to look for offensive linemen. He's going to look for defensive linemen. They are going to rebuild this team in that particular form because the best teams right now are the most physical teams. And if you're going to win in December or January or even, God forbid, February, guess what you're going to have to be? More physical than the other team because that's where it's leaning right now.
I agree with that. I got to get into a lot of stuff that Mike Tomlin talked about in his Tuesday press conference. We're going to do that in just a minute here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, so don't go anywhere. He he addressed the Marcus Allen, Deontay Johnson penalties, as well as the question about the team focusing on trying to avoid having their first losing record since 2003. All of that addressed very soon. We'll stay, so keep it right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. But first, we got to talk to you guys about ultimate Pro Football GM. Now, Ultimate Pro Football GM is a game that you can download right to your phone. I have it on my phone. I play it, and it's a lot of fun. It's easy. It's fast. If you want to show your skills as a GM and scouting and building a franchise and making the right decisions, well, here's your chance. Because when you when you play this game, when you download it, you can hire the right coaches and coordinators, fire whoever you want. You can get your team doctor, your sports, your sports psychiatrist, everything along there. You can trade players, cut players, sign, make draft picks, trade for draft picks, all the things that you wish you could do for the Pittsburgh. Steelers you can do in in this game as well as building out the stadiums doing all of the different amazing things it's a lot of fun I'm in season five like literally I did I did a, I did a full season since the last time I talked to you guys and I got another Super Bowl championship for for the for the team that I run so go get ultimate football GM right now it's a realistic game that focuses on so many different details you'll have a lot of, a lot of fun playing and locked on Steelers listeners can get a, a free 100% boost to their franchise by using a promo code locked on that's L O C K E D O N locked on all capital letters all one word in the game store to download the game visit ultimate-gm.com that's ultimate-gm.com to get ultimate football gm start your fantasy today this episode is also brought to you by audible audible is releasing a new slate of football podcasts that we're sure you're going to love that's why you'll be able to find a sneak peek of the new podcast the league available on locked on nfl right now where a sneak peek can be found right now narrated this show is narrated by super bowl champion and legendary smack talker richard sermon and sports broadcaster and rising star Taylor Rooks. The League is an eight-part docuseries about the most bizarre, inspirational, and unlikely stories connected to America's favorite sport, pro football. You won't want to miss the, these untold stories spanning from the 1940s to the present. One bonus episode is called The Way of the Cowboy, looking into the 1977 Cowboys that brought Bruce Lee's protege to teach defense martial arts and ushered a new approach to training in the sport of football. So head over to the Locked On NFL podcast for a bonus episode of The League or catch the full series wherever you get your podcast. Available right now. Audible. Get in the game. Continuing here, as we say always, we do back-to-back ad reads. We keep it rolling here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Josh, I I, I, I want to address this com this this way that that, that Tomlin responded to this question first because it was a question about the team and Deontay Johnson made this comment is like it is important to us that we do not hand, we're not part of the team we're not the team that hands like that's, that's part of Mike Tomlin's first ever losing season. Here was how that question was asked and responded to by Mike Tomlin Tuesday during his press conference. In the last two weeks or so, a couple of your players have spoken to not wanting to be a part of any team that would stop the streak of since 03 not having a losing season. How important is that to you, and how much do you sense it's important to them? We hadn't talked about it. Um, you know, we just focus on, on this week. If you do, um, it kind of checks some of those silly peripheral boxes. Um, we got a big game this week. We win this game. We do what's required to prepare to win this game. Um, it answers all those little sidebar silly questions. Like you were talking about. That is Mike Tomlin in a nutshell. He's like he's not trying to play play these games. He's not trying to fucking focus on that. And li- listen, the non losing season streak. It's I think it's significant for a resume. It's awesome when you look when you step back and we're we're the people analyzing. We're doing it on the shows, radio, TV, podcast, wherever. I think it's it's something that that's cool to talk about because it's not something that's been done in the NFL. But if you think that Mike Tomlin's going to work every day and bang in a sign that says no losing seasons, you're gravely mistaken about how this franchise operates. And he, I think the way that he answered that question is exactly how he sees it. Heck, he's talked like that about that record before when people have tried to use it to pump him up. I, I want to point out two things. Number one, the fact that you hear it from a guy like Deontay Johnson, whom is one of the veterans on this team, if only by default, because this team is so comparatively young as far as years in the league. But when you hear a guy like that say, you know, we don't want to be the first, the team that has the first losing season for him. And that is one of those things. That's one of the sound bites that you point to when you hear someone say, well, he's lost the locker room. Are you sure? Because that comment came after a game where they were five and eight, 
And I know they were competing against another five and eight team, but that was a team trying to compete for a division championship because they're in a bad division. I understand that. But that was a team that was playing for something. And they walked into that team stadium and they hit him in the mouth. Yep. And after that game was over, one of the players on that roster said, we don't want to be the team that gives him his first losing season. That doesn't sound like a player on the team that's lost its coach in the locker room. And again, that's Deontay like Johnson, that. who has not scored a touchdown this year, who could who could be complaining and throwing a fit. Like, you know, how a lot of receiver, people talk about how wide receivers are supposed to act. And he's not doing that. He's staying focused and he's saying, this is what we got to do. And we want to do this for the coach that, that, that we that we love working for. And he just had his best game of the season last week. Ten targets, ten catches. And he made a couple of plays that not only helped this team win this game, but also seal this game in the fourth quarter. He could easily be mentally checked out. He could he could have been the first guy checked out after the Jets game when he reportedly got into it with Mitch Trubisky. He could have been checked out then and been done. And you hear this after, what, 13 games or 14 games about how they're still trying to play for this man? That's why when I hear people say, oh, he's lost a locker room. I'm like, what locker room have you been in? Because it doesn't sound like it when you hear the players talk about it. The second thing to your point that you mentioned, I, and I don't know how many people have watched this. They probably have it. And I can tell who probably has or has not watched that episode of the Pivot Podcast by how they talk about this man. Because when Mike Tomlin went on the Pivot Podcast with Ryan Clark, Fred Taylor, and Channing Crowder, they tried their best at the beginning of that episode to pump this man up and totally emphasize the fact that he's never had a losing season. He's coached in two Super Bowls and won one. He's probably got a gold jacket for the Hall of Fame. And they asked me, you know, well, how do you, you know, how do you handle that as far as people who criticize you? And he goes, I don't think about that. And they're like, well, why not? Like, you know, you're, you're one of the few guys that's done that. And he goes, I don't think about that because it doesn't help me do my job. He said, if I do that, I'm seeking comfort. And people, people hate when he mentions not seeking comfort because they want him to seek comfort and he refuses to right. do it. There's that thing. Also, they want him to talk about it. He refuses to because if he starts talking about it, it strengthens the argument for people that can't hold it over his head. Mm -hmm. That is the issue. They want to hold it over his head. He doesn't want to hold it there. He doesn't want to make it anything bigger than what it is. The term in pro wrestling is no sell. He no sells it completely because if he no sells it, then it can't be more ammunition used against him. Because when you've been in the place for a decade and a half and the same thing's been happening to you for a decade and a half, you kind of learn how to avoid the same thing happening to you as many times as possible. So if you know if saying a certain thing, if you know entertaining a certain line of questioning, if you know commenting on a certain particular thing that people that aren't you like to harp on, guess what it does? It gives them something to use against you. And he refuses to do that, which also makes a lot of people angry because, you know, what they can't use it against him. But it all comes back to the same central thing. This is not something he emphasizes. It's not something he necessarily cares about. He wants to win every game he plays in. He's another guy who could say, you know what? Let's pack this in. TJ Watt, I know you want to play. I know you want to get back out there and be with your guys. But you missed half the season already. you got three or four different injuries that you're dealing with. Sit down, rest up, I need you next year. He could have done that a few weeks ago. Or he could have done that after the bye week and he didn't. He could have told Kenny Pickett, you know what? Concussion number two, let's shut you down. Let's worry about you next year and try to get this try to get this thing back on track for next season. He's not doing that. Do I particularly agree with that one? Probably not. But still, it, it comes back to the fact that this man is trying to win every game his team plays in, regardless if we think the game is meaningless or not, regardless if the playoffs are on the line or not, regardless if it ends in a losing season or otherwise. That's not his focus. His focus is game to game, win the game in front of you, worry about the next one later. And people, for some odd reason, they either don't like it or they want to make a bunch of noise about it or they want to use it as some kind of detracting thing that counts against him. And I'm sitting there going, nice try, but he's not going to bite on it. But people keep trying. I mean, maybe one day the dam will break. I mean, you know, it's been, it's been what, going on 16 years? Maybe by year 21 or 22 the dam will break. We'll see. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that that's. It, it, I mean, it's obviously not going to. He, he's not letting it break now. But I, I just. I think it. It shows that they, his team is staying focused on the things that matter and focusing on football. And again, focusing on changing the football. I think that they know that 
if they're able to get this offensive line together, if they're able to add some pieces there, they have the one-two punch in the backfield of Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. They have a quarterback in Kenny Pickett who can manage the situation and is, is, and is growing and takes his job very seriously and can be a leader for that group. You know, Jalen Hurts, he's not a quarterback that's going to be up there with Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen in the, the, the ceiling that he has, but he combines his game so well and he's a leader, and that's why the Eagles, I think, wanted to add him to the system that they were building and why they're 13 and one right now with him at the helm. So I, I mean, again, I'm not saying Kenny Pickett is Jalen hurts, but I think they have similar styles and how they lead and how they, they're not that the, 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 the five star super capable quarterback that does everything has the strongest arm or the fastest legs, but they're able to put things together and package themselves within a game plan and study the game plan to win important moments. I want to talk to you though, Josh also about, the um, another response, a couple other responses Mike Tomlin had because we were talking about Deontay Johnson. He also had an act on Sunday that cost the Steelers for a little bit, ended up not costing too much because they ended up getting in the end zone that drive. Um, and, but also Marcus Allen's uh, antics, he addressed these comments, and I think it goes more to again his approach and how he keeps things focused in house for the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll talk about that and how the Steelers got to ha- got to adjust their game or just focus on how they could adjust their game to face the, the the Las Vegas Raiders as Devontae Adams is coming to town and he can be a problem if they don't put him in check. But first, we got to talk to you guys about Total Wine and More. Total Wine and More is the best place for you for you all to go find all the different bottles that you want to get for the holidays. With so many great bottles to choose from, it's easy to find a, a, a favorite new Cabernet or a Chardonnay or the perfect gifts for everyone on your list with some help from a friendly guide. And all that with the confidence of knowing you found something special for the lowest price. Love what you find and only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Drink responsibly. B21. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Josh Taylor, and uh, we are kind of focusing on some things. Now, Josh... We all saw Marcus Allen's penalty and Deontay Johnson's taunting penalty and, the, and how they set back the Steelers. Not too much. I mean, they, they were moments that could have been dismantling. They could have, you know, the Deontay Johnson's penalty could have cost the Steelers a touchdown. It didn't. Uh, Marcus Allen's penalty did cost the Steelers three points, uh, didn't get cost them a touchdown, but still costly moments, undis- undisciplined mistakes, things that the, that the, that the Steelers, uh, you know, probably wanted to address in the background. But when Mike Tom was asked about it, this was his response, and after he gives it, I want to get your thoughts on it. Here's what Mike Tomlin said when asked about those penalties. Mike, how do you engage the discipline of this team right now? You know, if you're talking about a couple of plays that transpired last Sunday, not good. Um, but largely, I do feel good about the overall discipline of us, certainly. Have you had conversations with either? I'll leave that in house. I'm not going to give you the pound of flesh you're looking for. Mike. So there, there you have it right there. Mike Tomlin being, being, being like, look, yeah, in those two plays, it was bad. But his point was, that hasn't been an issue. We haven't been talking about that all week, all, all season long. There's been a couple minutes here and there where some one person makes an individual mistake and it's bad, but – it doesn't. It's not a repeat thing. Like Chakuma Core for what you know with the the moment where he dove on a, on a Cleveland Browns player. That was you know a, a, that was a thing that happened. But it ain't happened. It ain't happened since. You yeah. know, Mark, Marcus Allen for as as much as I I had Allen Saunders on our show yesterday. Yesterday, Josh and Allen brought up a very. You know, he's like Marcus Allen isn't good enough to do dumb things like that. But here's my thing: Marcus Allen does do silly things away from the field, but that's the first time that he's cost them like that in a game. And again. They still kept their focus and made it not matter. I think it's very on brand Tomlin to be like, hey, we addressed this from the inside. This was addressed. It may not be everything that you wanted it to be, but I'm not going to let you know what that is because we don't put our our, 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 in, our inner dealings out for everyone to see in the public. This is going to be one of those things I bring up that some people are going to eye roll about, but you kind of can't deny it because it is what it is. One of the things that people like to use against Mike Tomlin is that he's a player's coach or that, you know, players seem to like playing for him. And one of the reasons why they like playing for him, because he doesn't bury them in public and in the media. It's not something he does. The days when you can get away with that 25, 30 years ago, those days have long since gone. They are not coming back. I don't know why people keep looking for them, but continue to find yourselves disappointed. However, 
However, another anecdote. If you talk to players that have played under Mike Tomlin, the Arthur Motes, the Ryan Clarks of the world, even the Ike Taylors of the world, whom I used to work with, and the Chris Hoax of the world, whom I work with currently, you know what they will tell you? If you made a mistake big enough, Coach T may not mention it after the game, but when you got in the film room, you were going to hear about it. Because remember they used to talk about the news? Yep. And the guys that made the, the big egregious mistakes, you heard about it in the film room, and you were pretty much – you, you were pretty much brought out, you know, you were put on blast in front of everybody about what you did. So we might not know what Mike Tomlin said to Marcus Allen, but I'd like to think when they got in the film room, they probably heard exactly how Mike Tomlin really feels about what they did. But like he said, he's not going to make that public. And I know there are people out there that want that pound of flesh and they want it for two reasons. One, they want it because it just satisfies their outrage. And two, if they don't get it, they can talk about how, you know, well, he never really does this and he didn't do anything. But even if he did reveal what he did and said, it wouldn't be, it would be too much for them anyway. It, it, it still wouldn't be satisfactory. It, for some people, they just want something to complain about what he does in order to say, see, this is why he's not a good coach. So even if he had told you what he'd done, it wouldn't have been enough for some people anyway. So once again, like we talked about previously, why engage? Why give that kind of stuff away if you know it's going to be used as ammunition? So of course he's not going to say anything. Yeah, I also think it's one of those things where people are like, well, this wouldn't happen under X coach's <laughs> name. And a lot of people always point to Bill Belichick. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah, okay. Bill Belichick's team admittedly went rogue and literally threw the game away to the other team at the end of the game. Not to mention the years of examples when Bill Belichick's teams player and players went rogue and did things that were that were poor that were that were poor of taste and cost the cost the team yards, gains, penalties, all sorts of things. And Bill Belichick, great coach. Those moments don't detract from the fact that he's a great coach and all the things he put together. But football is a game where you have 53 men on an official roster every, every week, more people on a practice squad roster. Some people are going to have stupid moments. And I think that that's, that's part of that is it doesn't count against the coach because it happens once in a while. If it's every week, if it's costing them all the time in big moments, like this was one of my biggest criticisms of Marvin Lewis. In the playoffs game, you have Pac, Pac-Man Jones freaking out and costing them a penalty. Bontez perfect costing, literally just giving the game away at the end in a key game. That's different. But usually this, when the Steelers are losing, it's because they're getting beat at the point of attack. They're being outplayed. Those type of things on the field, not necessarily, not, not necessarily these, these undisciplined things where they're just giving away stupid penalties. I think that the, the attempted narrative that this is all about Mike Tomlin and, and the players and undisciplined, I, I think it's, it's a very big reach because they're focused on game plan things. And this was another thing uh, that, that they, that they were focused on was they know they're going up against Devontae Adams. So when I asked Mike Tomlin about what they got to do, what, what they have to do, he's he's ready for it. He says, listen, it's up to us on the field. Here's Mike Tomlin answering my question about what they have to do better there. You guys have played some really talented receivers this year who've had success. What do you guys have to do differently to contain Devontae Adams? Play better. You know, maybe in some of the instances in which you mentioned. Um, you know, when you got a guy that's dynamic like that, you, you work to minimize him and maybe minimize him in specific moments. But to deny him, I think, is – you know, not realistic. I, I'd imagine most of the people that play the Vegas Raiders understand that he's going to get the ball. Um, yet and still, he's gotten the ball and has gotten 11, 12 touchdowns. And so uh, we'll throw our hat into that into that mix as well. Michael. So, I mean, that's that. this is like the whole thing. They're facing a guy. They know, like, listen, this guy is really talented. We're not going to be able to deny it, but we have to find ways to limit him. And these are the things. This is why whenever you hear a Mike Tomlin press conference, that's why those are where my, my questions are focused because I want to see like, hey, what is their approach to this? Because they've been roasted by A.J. Brown, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, uh, a, a number of big name receivers, Stephon Diggs, Gabe Dave. You, you, you can talk about a lot in a lot of these games what's gotten away from them. They gave up these big plays to these big name wide receivers, and you got maybe the biggest name wide receiver in the NFL and Devontae Adams coming up. How do you plan to respond to it? And he's like, "Listen, we acknowledge that this is that this, that this, this is a, a a supreme talent that we're coming in, but we got to find a way to limit it." So that's again why I ask those questions. I just, Josh, it just seems again. I think it's this shows why the Steelers are the way they are is that they focus on these types of things and they'll address that other stuff privately, but they're not overly focused on it. And like I think some people want to make it seem in the public. 
I, I need to provide this caveat because the performance of two particular players on this team and the persons of Devontae Adams and Josh Jacobs, I have a very personal vested interest in. I'll leave it at that. That That's one thing because I have them both on two different fantasy teams. And in each of them, I have the number one seed in the ongoing playoffs. So I have a vested interest in this. So I'll just leave that to the side. However, from another standpoint, it's really hard – when you face an offense that has guys that are that dynamic in the persons of Devonte Adams and the league's leading rusher in Josh Jacobs, who by the way yeah. has managed to tear up like three or four different teams. And he was questionable in the injury report every single week in the process of doing it, which is insane. But now you're talking about having to minimize both of these players. And not only can Devonte Adams make plays deep in the passing game, Josh Jacobs can make plays in the passing game too. So this makes us, all the more complicated when you add Josh Jacobs into the equation. But yes, to your point about Devontae Adams, this is a guy who routinely takes the top off defenses. And sometimes they're taught, they're trying to keep it from taking the top off and he does it anyway. It doesn't matter. He's just that talented. He's just that good. And I'll say this, and I know some people like to make the argument to the contrary, but look at Green Bay's offense with Devontae Adams over the last several mm. years and look at it now. That mm-hmm. is the difference when you lose a guy that's that dynamic. When you're talking about one of the two best receivers in the league last year, him and Cooper Cup, as far as like the same number of targets, like they, these are two guys that got the ball because they were the guy that you throw the ball to when you need somebody to catch the ball. So as far as the preparation for a guy like him, and like you mentioned, they they faced a lot of dynamic receivers this season. It's hard to try to game plan, not only – for scheming up a guy like him one-on-one, but you also have to decide when you double cover him, you have to decide when you're going to try to blitz because that's going to affect your coverage behind you. You also have to decide when you're going to focus on the run if you're trying to stop Josh Jacobs because that's going to affect your coverage behind you. All that stuff comes into play with this game plan. So even if you just had Devontae Adams just isolated by himself as a singular uh, line on the page, that's one thing. But there's a lot of other stuff with this Raiders offense that you have to take into account that make it that much harder. So now it's more or less the matter of can you limit Josh Jacobs first and force the Raiders to be in third long situations to where now you can put your attention on Devontae Adams because that's what they're going to have to do in order to win this game. you got to slow down one guy and hope you can minimize the other as a result of it. And that's a really hard job because teams haven't done it much all season long. It's going to be a tough challenge, but that's why the Steelers stay focused. And again, I th- that's why I wanted to highlight. Yeah, sure. There's these other narratives, the other things the Steelers could be focusing on, uh, things that they, things that like, like, hey, yeah, why don't you address this publicly? Why don't you do this over here? Or that they, they don't have time for that. They have to game plan for a team like you said, leading rusher in the NFL, arguably the best receiver in the in, in the NFL, a team that just pulled off one of the most unbelievable ways to win just <laughs> just last last week. And you have to win this game if you want to have a shot at the playoffs. Even though I'm, again. They have a point zero zero like five chance percent chance of getting to the getting to the playoffs at this point. But if you want to finish strong and show that hey, the next next year we're going to be ready. It's games like these that if you find a way to win, it sets a great tone for how they're moving forward. We'll address that great tone as as we as the week continues on. The Steelers do play Saturday. We still got crossover Thursday. Your boy Q from the, from the from the Locked On Raiders podcast will be on this show. So. Do tune in on Thursday. Josh, thanks so much for joining us here on the Lockdown Steelers podcast. Let people know they can find you, follow you, and get more of your work. On TV, CBS Pittsburgh, otherwise known as KDK TV. On the radio side, 93.7 The Fan, which, by the way, this upcoming Wednesday, I will have a certain guest by the name of Mr. Chris Carter. That guy's going to be on the show, right? I should be putting this way. That guy's going to be on the <laughs> show. We're going to talk about Steelers, and we're going to talk about pit basketball, too, because – Pitt basketball is in a pretty interesting position coming out of the non-conference schedule. They're actually having a winning record, so is Duquesne. So we'll talk some college hoops, and we'll talk some Steelers. That's coming up Wednesday night on 93.7 The Fan. So a lot of stuff happening right now. Check it out. You'll see both of you'll hear both of us there, and you'll hear Josh all night long. Thanks, Josh, for joining the Locked On Steelers podcast. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and thank you for checking out the Locked On Steelers podcast. Always, you can find this show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. Like this video if you saw it on YouTube. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes, and you can also get our bonus content, like when we interviewed Alan Fanica 
uh, over the weekend. That was a great talk. Also, if you're listening to us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, anywhere like that, if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, rate us five stars, give us a positive comment with that five star rating, and you get a special shout out at the end of the show. Thanks again, Josh. Back tomorrow with, with Q from Locked On Raiders on Crossover Thursday. 